uncertain hope of resurrection. These are the beliefs on which monotheism has based itself and on, upon which it continues to exert its extraordinary and lethal power. And I won't, I, I won't take your offer, uh, Rabbi, I can't take it. I can't say all they're talking about is posthumous fame. All they're talking about is reputation. After all, people still read Shakespeare. Surely that proves that there's an afterlife. No, I'm sorry. It's, it's a confusion of categories. It's not comparing like with like. It's not even non-overlapping magisteria. It's, it's radically discrepant views of what reality is. And if, if religion would say, we don't promise you anything after death, that would be the end of it. And Shmuley would be talking ethical Judaism, and I would be saying, ah, atheism is compatible with any belief you like. You can be an atheist and be a supporter of Ayn Rand, the most famous atheist in America. You can be an atheist and a nihilist. You can be an atheist and a fascist. All you have to do is say that you reject the supernatural dimension. But that's the most crucial thing. And now the critique of religion that we've evolved over the years in mortal combat with it is this, essentially. First, that it has a very queasy relationship with anything called evidence. That it makes very, very large claims for itself. Perhaps Rabbi Shmuley won't choose this evening to do so, but it claims to talk in terms of redemption, of salvation, and even of eternity. And there's an inverse relationship between what it claims and the amount of evidence that it can muster. And that this is its original, if you like, uh, sin. Uh, second, that it seems to deal in absolutes, that it appears to want us to think of a God who is in some way or another a dictator in this world, and if this one should prove disappointing, I think you used the word dress rehearsal, the term dress rehearsal, a mere ante room, if you think this is unfair, if you think this is discrepant, if you think this is irrational, why do the evil prosper, why do the good get trampled underfoot and left behind? Never mind. Once you've squeezed with agony, agony through the keyhole of death, there's another whole world where all that will be put right. Where every tear will be dried and every injustice compensated. Which, if it was true, would be a terrible exercise in sadomasochism. Why put a bunch of rats into a labyrinth of torture? See how they do. Surprise them with new rules. Even bigger surprise when you squeeze them through that last gap. Ah! Now we have you, and now you're due for a verdict against which there is no appeal. If you don't believe in that as a scheme, you don't believe in God, you don't believe in the biblical promise of redemption and salvation, and you certainly don't believe in the resurrection. So, I think Shmuley's word on that is uh, that that's the case, is as good as anyone else's, and I would say perhaps better than some. But I'm talking also to people who will be tuning into this broadcast later, and I have a captive audience, and so <laughs> I've got a couple more points to make before I rest the case that you smoothed for me. Um, <laughs> <clears throat> that it's based on, this, another element in our critique of it, is that it's based on wishful as well as delusional thinking, above all wishful thinking. What is a stronger desire? in the human species than that we shall conquer death. We are the only primates, as far as we know, we're the only members even of our own species, the primate species, who are fully aware of death and absolutely unreconciled to the idea of our own extinction. Even though we know our chemical composition, we know we are made out of the same elements as the rest of the cosmos. In fact, rather miraculously, if you want to call it that, we're even made out of stardust. Stars had to die for us to live so we think it's overwhelmingly probable that when we die, our chemical ingredients will return to the, the natural biological and biochemical cycle, and there seems no evidence to the contrary. There may be animals uh, who know how to fear death, but certainly no animals who know how to deny it. That's why it's so interesting that among the most frequently asked questions of people to their priests and rulers and rabbis about the afterlife is, will my dog or cat be there too? Um, and you notice they only ask that, will Timmy be in heaven or Rover? They never say, will that hellish tabby I once had um, <laughs> be reassembled in the infernal regions? This is enough to show how wishful the thinking is. Now, I see that Shmuley has Dinesh's um, clever but, I think, thin book on the case for the afterlife in front of him. And in, in one debate that I had with Dinesh, he, he briefly 
gave me pause by saying, yes, wishful thinking for heaven, all right. That's hedonistic, that's a hope, that's a desire. But then why would people who were wish thinking, why would they want hell? Good point, and it, it's, and it, it tells against simple-minded Freudianism, uh, as does a lot of other evidence. But not all of our wishes are completely transparent to us, I think, and not all of them are hedonistic, especially as they respect or regard other people. I was one of the two or three white people in the audience at Madison Square Garden in 1985 when Louis Farrakhan gave his famous address to a packed house of the Nation of Islam and addressed the Jews of, of the greater New York, New York area in a taunting manner and reminded them, and I'll never forget it, he said, uh, and remember Jews, when God puts you in the ovens, it's forever. And I shall not soon forget the great moan and groan of pleasure that came from that audience at hearing that. And I should have been prepared for it, not just by the stupidity and nastiness and criminality on which this religious nutbag makes his living in this country. Call someone an imam or a priest or a reverend, there's nothing they can't get away with in our culture. <laughs> If I could change one thing, it would be that. The second would be when someone gets up and says, I'm a person of faith, that you, they don't get respect for it. They, expect, they think that's a respect-producing statement. I am a person of faith. You know, I'm a person who will believe practically anything or no evidence at all. <laughs> well, you said it, mister. Respect comes later. Um, I digress. I shouldn't have been surprised by this orgy of sadism and cruelty and gloating from Farrakhan's religious audience because I've read the Christian fathers. I've read Tertullian, who, answering some questions, one of the great fathers of the church, we see why hell is unpleasant. Why is heaven such fun? It seems to be rather dutiful. Endless praise, endless worship, endless subjection, uh, endless tedium. Uh, you think that the Lord himself, after the first five billion years, would have had enough of the songs of praise. No, it's got to go on. <laughs> okay, where's the good bits? Tertullian says that we've thought of the good bits. In the intervals of that, you can go to the edge and you can go and look down and gloat on the torments and endless tortures of the damned. We've thought of that. Now, excuse me, that is a founding statement of Christianity. You can't disown it now. These churches wouldn't be here oppressing us. These mosques wouldn't be here incubating madmen and suicide bombers. There wouldn't be mad Jewish settlers on the West Bank thinking if we could only steal other people's land and bring on the Messiah and Armageddon, everything would be all right. There wouldn't, there wouldn't be anything of this if it was left to the rabbi, if it was left to the rabbi and myself, but it's not. And the, his, the Joseph Ratzinger, who's, His Holiness the Pope, has just got off the plane in England today to announce that atheists are Nazis. <laughs> an overdressed little ponce who was himself a member of the Hitler Youth, <laughs> dares to speak this way. He leaves, he leaves the palace that quite rightly, quite rightly, Shmuley points out, was built on the sale of indulgences. Well, picture the church as if it had not done that. Are you talking about the same formidable multinational force? No, you're not. Have they disowned what they did? No, they haven't. Are there not still chantries all around the world where prayers are paid for and said, for the souls of the dead, so that there may be remission from sin, measured, by the way, in years and decades. Or, if you've paid a lot of money to a chantry, maybe centuries of remission from sin, as if the Gregorian calendar is used for matters of eternity and infinity. The pathos, the obviousness of this fraud still goes on, and Ratzinger himself is, is reinstituting the idea that by making donations to the church and regular appearances at its festivals, there may be an element of remission too. And only now is it being discussed that St. Augustine's vile idea that the souls of unbaptized children may not go to hell but go to an indefinite misery of limbo <laughs> until the second coming uh, may possibly not have been the way, quite the tone of voice in which to speak to parents who'd lost their child. I'm not neutral about this. I don't think those statements are what they clearly are, man-made. Silly, pathetic, mediocre, and erroneous. That is a job within the compass of anyone in this room or beyond. No, I say, I say, I go first. It's an evil doctrine. 
It's a wicked doctrine. It proceeds from people who want, quite wisely and quite shrewdly, real power over real human beings of a really absolutist sort in the only world we've got, which is the here and now. How smart they are to do it, how overdue we are to tell them that we reject this totalitarian interpretation of human life. Well, I'm not going to say why I don't think non near-death experiences are impressive now. So you've spared me that, thank you. <laughs> Although I wish someone would ask about them. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I think, excuse me, <coughs> I think I've probably trespassed anyway on the allotted uh, period of my time. But what I say is, thanks for coming, and bring it on, and don't make me suspect that you're sparing me. Thank you. <laughs> okay, Shmuley, it's your turn for rebuttal, but take the gloves off. Take the gloves off. And tell me about the afterlife. Well, um... Does the Ram Bam recommend it or not, Seng? <laughs> does, he, does he say there's, there'll be resurrection? Where well, I'll, say, I'll get to all of that. Where's the difference between you and Maimonides? Christopher, I, I you know. create a straw man, and then you beat the hell out of it. No, Fair no, enough. No, you say that this is religion, and therefore I think it's absurd. I'm telling you firmly that Judaism, which is the father, mother of all monotheistic faiths, has never put any kind of serious emphasis on, emphasis on the afterlife, period. Not because we don't believe it. I'll give you the Jewish idea of the afterlife. But because it's an afterthought. Anyone who serves God for the purposes of an afterlife is not religious. They are self-serving. They abrogate the central message of religion. Judaism is not about gaining entry into heaven. It's about creating heaven here on earth. And in that sense, it has inspired many irrational beliefs in the perfection of society so that this afterlife, this world that we can perfect, would be brought about even by people who are atheists and agnostics. Christopher says that religion is built on things with flimsy ev evidence, and yet he's a Marxist, and continues to say he's a Marxist, um, when Marxism is based on this irrational belief that somehow people will bury contention, competitiveness, give people according to their need. Uh, it's, a, it's a utopia. Now, if you look at history, we see that human beings cannot build a utopia. On the contrary, disease will always, you, you cure one, another arrives. Uh, you stop one war, we all thought the end of the Cold War was the end of conflict. Instead, unfortunately, global uh, 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 terrorism uh, er erupted. Why would anyone believe in this stuff? Obviously, it's somewhat irrational. But it is an idea that the Jews imparted to the world through messianism. What is the, my, my uh, uh, let me just get back a second. Messianism, as Christopher or any person in this room will tell you, is a this world phenomenon. The Jewish afterlife is right here. The wolf shall lie with the lamb. A child will lead um, uh, um, a predatory animal without being harmed. There'll be some sort of change in the nature of people that will want to actually be different. This is something we have all aspired to. Why do doctors look for cures when we know that ultimately these cures will elude us? None of this is very rational. It's all based on something super rational. This innate desire to make the world better against all the evidence that it can be done. There's no evidence there. It's called hope. It's how Barack Obama became the president of the United States. Even secular people have faith. That's the point. They may not have faith in God. They may not have faith in the Christian or Islamic afterlife. But they have faith that we can improve the world. And that is the emphasis that I'm making. Christopher can't take notions of religion that he considers religious, dismiss the others, and say, well, I want to bash these, because the ones that I don't like, I'm going to just dismiss them as secular. This isn't secular. The idea of utopia, which is be, Marxism is a secular utopianism, it's a religious idea. That's why it hasn't really happened yet. It is a religious idea. We now know it doesn't even work. We tried it. Market, it um, the market forces of an open economy produce wealth. It also produces selfishness, materialism, and all this other stuff. And rich and poor, some of the holes in the American economic system. But we tried Marxism and it failed. The people still grab onto it. Why? Out of irrational faith. Because they want to create their own afterlife. And I actually endorse that. Maybe not their mechanism. But I endorse the hope. And there's no evidence for it whatsoever. Nothing. All these leaders who are coming to the United Nations, they're all going to come, and they're all going to sit down and try to make peace, and Ahmadinejad is going to give his stupid ramblings, and my, my next-door neighbor, Muammar Gaddafi, is going to do the same, and everyone is going to, yeah, that's kind of weird, isn't it, to be the Jewish Forrest Gump. Um, 
They're all going to talk about peace and we're all going to believe that we can 